This lesson is introduction into fiber and textile evidence in forensic science. Let's say you're at the scene of a home assault and you find fibers that do not belong to any of the items discovered in the home. In addition to that, you also discover a nylon jacket outside the home that you believe does belong to the subject. By analyzing these fibers you discovered at the scene, you notice that there are three that do not match or are not consistent with any of the fibers discovered in the victim's home. These fibers are fiber A, fiber B, and fiber C. As a forensic investigator, can you identify what these fibers are and determine if any of them match the nylon jacket you discovered? Well, hopefully by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to do just that. So what is a fiber? A fiber is the smallest unit of a textile material and can come from a variety of sources. Fibers can come from clothing, carpets, animals, and synthetic fibers. If you encounter a fiber, it is paramount that is collected within 24 hours of the crime occurring. The reason for this is about 95% of fibers are lost within 24 hours. They are very small, they are very fragile, and they transport, they move very rapidly. Should you encounter a fiber at the crime scene, it can be collected using a variety of tools, such as tape, forceps, a vacuum, and even a sticky lint roller. When using a sticky lint roller, just be sure to cut off that piece that contains the hair and properly seal it. To package this evidence or to store it, you can use a paper bindle, an evidence bag, and it's important to secure the object the fiber is found on. If a fiber is found on something like a car door or a window, that can indicate somewhere the suspect has been. So you want to grab that entire piece of evidence in addition to the fiber found on it for further analysis. Looking at the structure of fibers, fibers are made out of repeating small identical units that are referred to as monomers. For example, here's one monomer, another monomer, another monomer. They're small units and they're all identical. In this case, I have two black circles attached to one white circle. Fibers are made of monomers because these monomers can combine together to form large objects that we call a polymer. Here you can see a polymer formed by attaching together the three monomers I showed you before. Let's look at an example with fibers, in this case cotton. So the cotton monomer are these carbohydrate molecules you can see here. They're small, they have the same formula, they're the same repeating unit, they're monomers. Attached together they form a long polymer called cellulose that will make up the entire fiber. There are two main categories or types of fibers, natural fiber and synthetic fibers. Natural fibers are made from a natural source, meaning something that already exists in nature. There's no human intervention with these products. These are things like animal fur, hair and webbing, plants, things like leaves, flowers and stems, and minerals like rocks and crystals. With synthetic fibers, these are fibers that are manufactured by humans, and they come in two primary varieties. One is regenerated fibers. These are natural fibers. We're taking things like animal fur or plants, but modifying them to add more strength or a new texture to them using manufactured human products. Second category is completely synthetic fibers. Synthetic polymers made from chemicals that are then spun into textiles. Let's just jump right into an analysis. Here is a microscope photo of different fibers. The synthetic fiber, polyester, is all the way on the right, and the rest are natural. Could you spot the difference between the two and already automatically determine which one's synthetic and which one's natural? I think you can. But let's look at more ways that you could identify a fiber. Where if you're presented something in a crime scene, you could immediately say this is synthetic, this is natural, this is wool, this is polyester. There are quite a few different identification tools available to forensic scientists to determine what fiber has been discovered. The primary one is microscope. Looking at the fiber under the microscope, different fibers have unique patterns that we can quickly learn to identify what kind of fiber we've discovered. Another is a flame test. By burning a fiber, we can record how it burns or melts or ashes or smells, and that can give us insight into what kind of fiber we've discovered. And then there are chemical tests. By applying a strong acid or a strong base to a fiber, different fibers react in different ways. Some dissolve in acid, some don't. Again, these are just different tools we can use to try to determine what kind of fiber we are likely working with. 
You can also perform chromatography. Chromatography is a way of separating pigments out by weight, sorry, by size and polarity. By doing this, we can determine what pigments are inside of a fiber, which could potentially tell us the manufacturing type of the fiber or where it's coming from if there are any unique pigments we discover. And there are so many other identification tools. You can test the density of fabric. Does it float or does it sink? You can test its ability to absorb a stain. If I apply a chemical, does it stain the fiber or is the fiber unaffected? And you can shine a UV light to see does the fiber glow and at what intensity? These are all different tools that produce different unique characteristics of fibers to give us that insight of what we have discovered. So let's look at the different kinds of fibers. The first I want us to look at are natural fibers. These are things that come from animals. And let's just go through a couple examples. One is silk. Silk comes from silkworms. When silkworms produce a cocoon, the fibers on that cocoon are then spun and used to make silk products. Here you can see those silk cocoons and what the fiber looks like. And here's what it looks like under the microscope. Really close, dense fibers, somewhat smooth appearance. Another example of an animal fiber is sinew. Sinew is made from the tendons of animals. Here you can see the fiber that's been removed from the animals and stretched out. And here's what it looks like under a microscope. Immediately you can see differences between the silk and the sinew. The silk is really smooth, somewhat spacious, somewhat ordered, whereas the sinew is going all over the place and very dense. Let's look now at wool. Wool is obtained from sheep. It's made from their fur. Here you can see a close-up of what the fiber, it's got a little bit of a spiral to it, and here it is under the microscope. Not as dense as the other two fibers and a unique color. With animal furs, there are a huge variety. I'm just going to show you the example of a camel's fur. Here you can see camel fur that's been removed from the camel and what it looks like under the microscope. Immediately, just by looking at the microscope, I think you could rapidly detect what kind of a fiber you have if you're looking at an animal fiber. Now, if I were to perform other tests to try to see if I'm working with an animal fiber, a flame test on animals will produce a flame that smells like burnt hair. If I treat the fiber with acid and it dissolves, it's probably a silk. And if I treat it with a base, wool, and it dissolves, wool is the only one that dissolves. Again, just more ways to narrow what you're working with. Animal fibers are always made out of protein. Proteins are made out of monomers called amino acids, and you can see one here. An amino acid is called such because it has an amine group on one side, a carboxyl on the other that makes it acidic, and then a central carbon. What's unique about proteins is these amino acid monomers can combine into a variety of complex structures. What happens first is individual amino acids form into a long chain, we call a polypeptide chain or its primary structure. More bonding can then occur to fold this into a sheet or a helix, where it again can bond into an even more complex polymer called the tesserae structure, which gives it a unique three-dimensional shape, and multiple tesserae structures can combine into a quaternary structure. Let's now look at plants. Some common plant fibers that we use to make the products humans currently consume. One is flax. Here you can see flax is a long, stringy plant, and that's reflected in the fibers that we can obtain from it. Under the microscope, you can see those small, thin fibers that make up flax. Cotton's another very common plant. Cotton forms into these ball-like structures on the outside of the plant. And looking under a microscope, you can see it has a lot of very thin bands like flax, but it frays a lot more. It goes out, and you've likely seen that if you've ever played with a cotton ball. Jute is another common plant used to manufacture textiles. Jute is what we use to make burlap. And here you can see under the microscope, much more consistent and sturdier than flax or cotton, which makes sense. If you were to go like this with cotton or flax, it's going to have a lot more play than something like burlap. It's very, very sturdy. And then we have bamboo. Bamboo can actually be dis put apart in order to make bamboo fibers. And you can see those fibers here under the microscope. They're somewhat flexible, but you can see how sturdy they are. Applying these common tests to plants, if you light a fiber on fire and it smells like burnt paper, you are working with a plant fiber. If you apply an acid, it will dissolve all plants. Plants are made out of, instead of amino acids and proteins like with animals, they're made out of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are made out of monomers that we refer to as monosaccharides. Saccharide means sugar, mono means one. So here you can see glucose, a very common monosaccharide. 
that can combine together to form two monomers together, which we refer to as a disaccharide, or you can have many monomers together to make a polymer that we refer to as a polysaccharide or many sugars. Cellulose is the most common carbohydrate polymer. If you're working with a plant fiber, odds are you're working with a fiber made out of cellulose. Let's look now at minerals. Now, not many fabrics are made out of minerals, but there are a couple. One is asbestos. Asbestos is made out of silicate minerals. Here you can see what the fiber looks like and what it looks like under the microscope. It's very, very jagged and brittle. Fortunately, we've learned that asbestos is a carcinogen. It causes cancer. So asbestos is not something you're going to see in any modern day investigation unless you're working with a really old facility. Fiberglass is something that is currently used. It's made out of plastic and glass and it's commonly used to insulate homes. It's great at trapping in heat. Here you can see what it looks like under the microscope. Jagged just like asbestos, but very, very small brittle fibers. Doing our test again, a flame test does not do anything to these minerals. They don't burn. They don't have any substances that can combust. An acid test will dissolve fiberglass, but not dissolve asbestos. Next up is regenerated fibers. A reminder that synthetic fibers, like regenerated fibers, are produced by combining natural components, such as cellulose, sometimes proteins, with man-made chemicals, typically petroleum or oil. Common regenerated fiber is rayon. Here you can see rayon under the microscope. It has some of the frayness of other natural fibers, but much sturdier and a much more robust color than you would see in nature. Another is acetate. Acetate looks like this under the microscope. Again, those smooth bands, you can tell that it is synthetic and not natural. Testing regenerated fibers on a flame test, they will melt instead of burning. A big giveaway that there's a synthetic compound inside that textile and an acid test will dissolve any regenerated fiber. The last fiber we need to look at are synthetic polymers. Synthetic polymers are made entirely by combining petroleum or oil polymers. These are manufactured and not found naturally in nature. Some examples are polyester, a very commonly used synthetic polymer. Here you can see under the microscope some bends of that polyester fabric, but notice how smooth those fibers are. Smoothness is unique to a synthetic fiber. Nylon is another common one, often used in a lot of different clothing products. And under the microscope, you can see again that smoothness that the fiber has. Acrylic, also very common in fabrics. Here you can see under the microscope, it's a lot stringier than nylon or polyester, but still smooth. And olefins are used as well. Testing these fibers, a flame test will cause them to melt. An acid test is going to dissolve nylon, but not the other synthetic fibers. So summarizing all of the ways you can identify the fibers we've went through. A flame test, if it smells like burnt hair, it's an animal fiber. If it smells like burnt paper, it's a plant fiber. And if it melts instead of burning, you're dealing with something synthetic. Applying acid to a fiber, if it dissolves, it is a plant, it is silk, fiberglass, regenerated, or nylon. If you apply a base and it dissolves, you're dealing with wool. These are all just common tools to help you narrow down what you're working with. To go from a fiber to a textile, fibers are too small if you're going to use individual ones to make any textiles such as your clothing out of. So they're typically spun together to form something called a yarn. Those yarns can then be woven together to form a textile, the fabrics you're used to working with on clothing and that you see lining furniture like couches and beds. Textiles are unique in that they are spun in different ways and can have different thread counts. Because of the great diversity of ways we make textiles, this provides an avenue for forensic investigators to identify the origin or source or to match a fiber that's found to a piece of clothing that's found at a crime. For example, the way textiles are woven together can vary. Sometimes it's a plane, just straight horizontal, straight up. Other times it can be a basket, over, under, over, under. You can have a satin, a twill, or a lino. By zooming in and looking at this under the microscope, you could match it to another object and see if it's consistent to determine the origin of a fiber. You can also look at the number of threads. Some very expensive fabrics have a very high thread count, whereas cheaper fabrics tend to have a lower thread count. Also when producing a yarn, the number of times a yarn is twisted 
that how many fibers are twisted in is referred to as being a ply, and fabrics can come in different plies, two ply, three ply, four ply. Determining the ply can determine the origin of the fiber. There are limitations though to using fiber evidence. Big one is fiber is class evidence. I cannot use a fiber to directly connect an individual to its origin, but I can determine a class. People who own this jacket or this hat or own this car that has this upholstery in it. They're not unique. We can't use them to pinpoint the subject. We can use fibers though to corroborate potential locations. If we if we take in a suspect and we look on their clothing and they happen to have fibers that are consistent with the carpet of the suspect's home, that could help corroborate some testimony or some discoveries. It can also be used as a way of potentially corroborating contact. When people come in contact with each other, they exchange everything. Think about Locard's exchange principle. Fibers are included in that. Some considerations when thinking about how fibers could have shown up on a crime scene or in another individual. If a fiber is directly transferred to a victim or a subject from the environment or between them themselves, we refer to that as a primary transfer. Fibers can also get picked up from a person and then transferred to the subject. Here's what I mean by this. A suspect could be walking through their home and pick up car carpet fibers from their residence go come in contact with the subject and transfer that carpet fiber from their home onto the suspect. This is what we mean by a secondary transfer. It's a fiber that's picked up and then transferred compared to a primary transfer where the fiber is directly transferred between the victim and its subject. Suspect. Something to keep in mind always as well is that the greater the contact between an individual and a surface that has fibers, the greater the amount of fiber that's going to transfer. Locard's exchange principle. The more, transfer, the more time and contact there is, the greater the exchange. So I started this lesson off asking you, could you identify these three fibers from the crime scene and determine if they can match a nylon jacket? I think you can do this now. To help you try to decipher the answer to these two questions, let me go ahead and test these fibers using the tests I covered. On a flame test, fiber A melts, Fiber B smells like burnt paper, and fiber C smells like burnt hair. With an acid test, fiber A dissolves, fiber B dissolves, fiber C has no effect. And with a base test, fiber A has no effect, fiber B has no effect, and fiber C dissolves. Can you identify these now and determine if they match the nylon jacket? My hope is yes, and you have an answer. I won't give it away in this video, but I hope you feel confident. Thank you, and I hope this helps you understand fiber evidence, and I'll see you next time.